I have a little story to tell you. This happens occasionally. Some of you may remember about, what was it, eight years ago, a guy by the name of Mike Lind. He, uh, he decided to uh, do a talk. His employer did not appreciate that. He said, fuck you, I'm gonna talk. That was very brave. Um, but, uh, you know, not all of us have this luxury to throw away our careers, etc. So we have a, a person who went through the rigor. He works on incredibly important, uh, he works on incredibly important things, um, but uh, he got his talk accepted. Everything went through the right channels. He was all set to speak at DEF CON, and his employer said, don't do that. And they said it with prejudice. So we are going to call this speaker patient zero. He cannot be on stage, he cannot be on camera, he cannot be named, but he is here and he does have a shot. And I want everybody to direct their attention over there, not the camera, please. Patient zero, why don't you give us a little wave? I don't see him, where is he? There he is. How about some DEF CON love for patient zero? You can do better than that. All right, we're supposed to be doing our shots here. Anyway, so first time speakers all do a shot. Thank you very much and hopefully one year you'll actually be up in front of all of these beautiful, well, people. Thank you. And now, Phil Zimmerman. Hi. Well, <clears throat> it's good to be here again. Um, you know, there's a story that I, I, I think it's, it's an apocryphal story, but it's a good story anyway, and that is that sometime in the 19th century, Americans, or at least a lot of Americans, thought that tomatoes were toxic. They thought if you eat tomatoes, you would die. And there was a guy that got up in public and ate a bunch of tomatoes, and he didn't die. And so everybody thought he would die, and there was a sharp intake of breath from the audience. But he didn't die, and after that, everybody knew you could eat tomatoes. Well, for a long time, for a hundred years, um, phone companies around the world have kind of created a culture for themselves that is very cooperative with governments in um, invading people's privacy. Um, and so these phone companies tend to think that there's no other way, that they, they can't break from that culture, that the tomatoes are poisonous. And um, my company, Silent Circle, has been working with a company in Holland called uh, KPN. It's the Dutch carrier. And uh, Jaya Ballou, uh, who has been to a lot of DEF CONs, is the chief information security officer there. I've known Jaya for about 12 years or so. And she um, decided that she wanted to break ranks from the rest of the phone companies and get KPN to uh, offer their customers uh, privacy, to offer their customers phone calls that, that are private that KPN can't wiretap. And so um, she uh, uh, is coming to us, Silent Circle, to help her do that. Actually, she, she contacted me to have me speak at some event at KPN, and I told her that I was involved in this new startup, and she didn't hear about it. And so she looked at the website, got all enthusiastic, and, and persuaded all the all the management of her company to pursue this. And so we have a nice relationship with KPN where um, for the first time you see a phone company offering its customers uh, real privacy so that people can call each other, so that people can whisper in each other's ears from far away without anyone intercepting that conversation. And so, um, my hope is that other phone companies will discover that these tomatoes are not poisonous and that they will follow suit. 
And we have a lot of other phone companies that are talking with us about doing the same thing. So I'm, what I'm hoping is that we're going to see a sea change here. Part of it is motivated by the Snowden revelations, creating market demand. There's generally more market awareness that it's time for a change, and the phone companies are feeling market pressure for this. So we have a way of doing this, and, and we're working with a lot of phone companies to bring it about. So I think that um, we may find a future where phone companies, a lot of phone companies, uh, help people have private phone calls. And uh, that'll be, that'll break a, a, a hundred year old culture for all the phone companies in the world. So anyway, we have this, we have this really cool startup company, Silent Circle. And um, it started when uh, I got a call from uh, a guy who wanted, to, wanted me to help him start a company. This guy's a Navy SEAL. And uh, he wanted to start a company that would allow um, US servicemen overseas to talk with their families back home. Because it really wasn't easy to do. The Pentagon would, would mostly just tell them what not to do. They would say, don't use Skype, don't do this, don't do that. But they didn't really have good advice for what they could do to talk to their families back home. And so he wanted to give them something for that. And he described the problem to me. I thought, yeah, sure. I had been working for many years on the Z Phone project. I've demoed Z Phone here at DEF CON a couple of times. Uh, and I thought, sure, um, I'm in. And so um, we started this company. I reached out to my friend John Callis, who was uh, CTO at PGP, and uh, he was working at Apple and then later worked for Entrust. And I thought, uh, we could get this done. And so now we've, we've got, uh, the company has grown quite a bit. We've, uh, we're up to around 100 people now. We've got um, customers that, we, we have three groups of customers. Uh, enterprise customers, uh, government customers, and consumers. Anybody can sign up for our service. Uh, the government customers include Navy SEALs. And it isn't just for Navy SEALs to call their families. It's Navy SEALs who are actually using it for operations. So um, uh, we're, we're, use, we're selling to special operations forces in, in Canada, Britain, Australia, United States. Uh, the U.S. Congress uses it. Uh, other parts of the government use it. We're seeing law enforcement use it. We had, a, we had a, about a year ago, we had a visit from the FBI at our office, and Mike Janke, my business partner, called me and told me that the FBI was in the office today, and I said, oh no, it's starting already. <laughs> and he said, no, no, they just were here to ask about pricing. And I thought, okay, that's, that's it, you know, we're, we're winning this. One of the first things that happened when Mike Janke approached me was that um, I, I wanted to make it so that politically, I mean, you know, I have a lot of experience in the 1990s fighting the crypto wars, so I have, a, I have some kind of political instincts about, you know, how to, how to change public policy. And I thought, uh, what we need is we need to create the conditions where nobody's going to lean on us to put a back door in because they need it themselves. If Navy SEALs are using it, if, if, uh, our, if, if our own government develops a dependency on it, then they'll recognize that it's, it would be counterproductive for them to try to get a back door in the product. Now, Maybe it was over an overabundance of caution because, you know, they never asked for a backdoor in PGP. Uh, but that took years to get that propagated out into government customers. We saw government customers take this up almost as soon as the product was ready. In fact, before the product was ready, they were asking about it. A lot of that has to do with Mike Janke's contacts from that community. And... Um, and so we've created the conditions where it's difficult for them to, to even bring up the subject of a backdoor. They won't. Um, so this is, this is 
that uh, this has been effective. This is this is the new hack. You know, in the 1990s, we did things like print the PGP source code in books and have them scanned in in Europe with uh, using OCR fonts and and CRCs on every line of source code and have them scanned in and turned back into binaries. Uh, that blew a hole in the export controls in the 1990s. So we're doing the same thing again here. Um, we're creating a secure phone technology that the government itself depends on and other governments around the world. And so we think that we can bring this into the mainstream. And it'll be possible for you to whisper in someone's ear from a thousand miles away and it'll become the new normal. Um, you know, most of these talks have questions at the end, but I, but being as how this is DEF CON and just the culture of DEF CON, I kind of feel like getting a few questions in the middle. So if anybody wants to raise some questions, I'd like to, I'd like to hear them. Yeah. Um, how do you expect U.S. telephone companies to survive with the way that Quest was ostracized and bankrupt, bankrupted by the, the government for not cooperating 10 years ago? Well, I don't know all the details of, of what led to Quest's problems. Uh, I would assume that there were other, that there were other elements to that. Uh, we're not going after U.S. cell phone carriers right now. We're, we're going after European ones and other ones are in other parts of the world. After we get a lot of those, then we can have a look at the U.S. carriers. Uh, my, my question is uh, about the metadata. Uh, they might not know the details of what you're saying, but does the systems that you're proposing protect you from uh, people just gathering metadata about who you're talking to? Uh, yes, they could get metadata uh, if, they, if they watch all the traffic going into our data centers. They could figure out, do time correlations of, of here's some packets coming from this direction and here's some packets going out to that direction and probably they're related. Um, you know, we don't actually store any uh, logs. We don't keep call records for end-to-end -end secure calls. Uh, so they can't ask us for the metadata. Now at, at places where we connect to the public switch telephone network, then the, you know, they could wiretap that and they could get the metadata for that because those are, those are uh, carriers that deliver the PSTN parts of the call. But for end-to-end -end secure calls, uh, we don't keep any logs of that. Being that uh, Silent Circle is uh, one of the few uh, commercial ware that's actually using PGP, do you think that there's an external force kind of preventing the adoption or the, I guess, the progression of the PGP in terms of the security technology? And that ex external force possibly being, I don't know, the government or any other group that doesn't necessarily want a secure encryption model well, to actually succeed? PGP has been used now for 20 years by a lot of people and a lot of companies. Um, we don't have a secure email service at this time. We did, we did have something uh, at the beginning of the company, but we closed that down uh, because, uh, because LavaBit closed theirs down because they came under pressure. They got um, a, uh, a court order that demanded that they hand over some things that we didn't want to be put in the same position. So we closed down our, our secure email service. Because email is a different thing than um, phone calls. Because phone calls are ephemeral and there's no need to keep any records. With email, you have to keep the email around on a server somewhere and the email has metadata. It has a from, it has a to, it has a subject line, it has a timestamp, it has an IP address. All those things have to be stored on a server. And so that's metadata that invites, uh, you know, a court order to have a look at it. In the case of LavaBit, they wanted more than that. They wanted uh, some cryptographic keys. We didn't want to be put in that position. So we, we, uh, we wiped out, destructively wiped out in a few hours our uh, entire um, 
uh, secure email service. We wiped out everything, the backups, everything. And we did it without warning, without telling our customers, uh, because we didn't want to be next. Now, some of the customers were kind of pissed off about that, but most of them respected our reasons for doing it. They, they, they recognized that we did it to preserve their privacy. Um, so, I mean, it makes sense that you would use PGP for Silent Circle, but I was referring to more about a, like a global adoption of PGP and the fact that you just don't see a lot of PGP penetrating into the different technologies. The reason why you don't see PGP being used ubiquitously is because it's, it's, it's necessary for people to understand how it works. They have to understand trust models. They have to understand public key infrastructure. Uh, they have to understand what it means to have public and private keys that are persistent and last for years and have to be managed and you have to know that a name goes with a key. Those are complicated things that we don't have to worry about when we make ephemeral phone calls. The way we're doing phone calls, the ZRTP protocol that, that was the basis of Zphone, I don't know, how many people here have seen uh, my old Zphone demos in previous DEF CONs? I guess everybody's so young, they don't, they don't think back that far. How many people here didn't know how to use computers back when PGP was, a, was, a, was uh, uh, causing so much trouble in the 90s? Yeah? Yeah, a lot of young whippersnappers. <laughs> um, PGP uh, has more complexity than a protocol that does secure phone calls. With the protocol we have now, the, call, the keys are made with an, an ephemeral Diffie-Hellman exchange. They're discarded at the end of the call. And so you don't have to, uh, you don't have to have a public key infrastructure. I think public key infrastructures are, are a, generally a bad idea. Uh, if you can avoid them, it's a good idea to avoid them. In fact, what we do, to prevent a man in the middle attack is we verbally compare a hash of the session key. The other person has it displayed on their screen, you have it displayed on your screen, you, you compare them over the phone using your voice, using your brain, using your ears, using your common sense to see if they match. If they match, everything's fine. If they don't match, then there's a wiretapper. There's a man in the middle because if, if there is no man in the middle, then Alice and Bob are both using the same session key. And so if you take a hash of that session key, display it on the screen, it's going to be the same hash. If there is a man in the middle, then Alice is connected to the man in the middle with a different session key than the other connection between the man in the middle and Bob. And so if you display that hash on the screen, they aren't going to match. And so you've detected the man in the middle. It's, it's kind of crude, it's kind of stupid, and that's what makes it so simple and foolproof. Um, it means that we don't have to rely on a centralized public key infrastructure. We don't have to wa rel rely on a certificate authority. You remember that some years ago there was a, a certificate authority in Holland that their, their master signing key was stolen by an uh, Iranian hacker. And the Iranian hacker used it to forge hundreds of public key certificates for things like Gmail and Yahoo Mail and Facebook. And then he gave the bogus certificates to the Iranian regime. And then the Iranian regime used them to do man-in-the-middle attacks on thousands of Iranian dissidents and, and arrested them. It would be hard to imagine a more spectacular failure of public key infrastructure than that. If you were writing fiction, you couldn't, you couldn't concoct a more spectacular f indictment of public key infrastructure than that example. And so that's why we don't use a public key infrastructure to protect our phone calls. We don't depend on that. We do our, our key exchange in the media layer because when I designed CRTP, I designed it to not trust the phone company I, I regarded the phone companies as not your friend because of the aforementioned hundred year cultural history where they cheerfully wiretap, you know, sometimes even over complying. Um, 
I didn't regard them as your friend, and so I designed the protocol to not share any keys with the phone company. We don't do the protocol through the signaling, we do it through the media. The signaling is generally under the control of the phone company or the service provider. The media goes directly between Alice and Bob, from your smartphone to the other smartphone. And that's, this protocol is designed to negotiate the keys through the media layer. We don't share them with the service provider, and in this case, a silent circle is the service provider. So we've, we're using a protocol years later, little did I realize that years later, I would actually be running a service provider that I designed this protocol not to trust. Um, so you don't have to trust Silent Circle. Uh, the protocol is designed so that you don't have to trust. We publish our source code, of course. Every cryptographic project I'm ever involved with publishes the source code. Uh, you can see that the clients do what they say they do. And even if our servers were seized by the NSA and carted off to Fort Meade, uh, they would not be able to get the contents of your phone call calls. In fact, you know, maybe we should let them do that, then it would save, we would have to pay the electricity. Of course, they would be able to tell who's calling who, but, you know, they can do that now if they, if they monitor the entire internet, they can see where all the packets are going, they could figure out by correlating this traffic is active at the same time that this traffic is active, so these two people must be talking to each other. But if you're in a place like um, Pakistan and you want to call somebody in some other part of the world, uh, the Pakistani intelligence is not going to know who you're talking to. Because all the calls, all the signaling would be going through our, our servers and the media uh, would be you know, going out of Pakistan in, the, in an encrypted form. Uh, yeah, right uh, there. Oh. You're going to have to yell really loud. By the way, there's people standing in line at the microphones. I should, I should probably do that. But in this, I'll, we'll just go with this question. Yeah, the question is, when we shut down our email service, we, uh, we started an initiative to do a secure email service that was built on a different architecture called dark mail. And, um, uh, you know, since that time, we've had crazy growth in other areas and it has taken up a lot of our engineering bandwidth. So, um, I don't really have much, that much to say about dark mail right now, but, um, you know, if anybody wants to hear more about that, they can talk to John Callis, our CTO. And John is more in tune with uh, what we're doing on dark mail. Yeah, uh, the question is, what kind of crypto suites are we using? After the Snowden revelations, we felt kind of, we felt a bit resentful that NIST had cooperated with uh, the NSA. And so to express our displeasure at NIST, uh, we offered alternative algorithms uh, in, to, uh, that you can elect to use instead of the NIST ones. In fact, we even made the other algorithms the default. We have a, a new elliptic curve that we commissioned Dan Bernstein to do for us. Uh, we use two fish as our block cipher. Uh, and uh, we use uh, um, uh, SCAIN as our hash function. And we have this, these, is, these are alternatives to the NIST choices. Now, I don't believe there's anything wrong with the NIST choices. We're not using this stupid random number generator that NIST did at the behest of the NSA. I can't imagine why anybody would use such a stupid random number generator. Uh, but apparently RSA did, and they put it in their B-safe subroutine library, which is closed source. Um, it's, uh, it's funny, uh, you know, back in the 90s, back when RSA uh, started the uh, criminal investigation against me by calling up the prosecutor and asking him to put me in prison, uh, they, they said that, that RSA was the most trusted name in cryptography. Uh, they even complained because we had said that about PGP in, in some press interview, and uh, we were just saying it as a kind of a 
statement of fact rather than as a, as a marketing slogan. And um, uh, Jim Bidzo sent us a nasty letter saying, we can't say that PGP is the most trusted name in cryptography because uh, that's a trademark of RSA. RSA is the most trusted name in, in cryptography. That was the trademark they had at that time. So he wanted us to cease and desist saying that because of the force of their trademark. So anyway, it's ironic that today we find that they were paid $10 million to put an NSA design uh, uh, random number generator in their subroutine library. But anyway, we don't, we don't use that. But we do, we, do use, uh, we do use other NIST algorithms that are good algorithms, that there's nothing wrong with them. And we offer those as a choice. You can use them uh, or you can use the new ones. And, and, so, and we default to the new ones. But it was really just an expression of displeasure about NIST's cooperation. It wasn't because there was anything actually wrong with the NIST algorithms that we were using. Uh, over here. Hi. So traditional cell phones are dependent on the baseband processor, which have a whole lot of inherent flaws depending on the protocol you're using. What are you doing to uh, mitigate baseband yeah. processor? That's a good question. Factor? You know, we had a meeting at NVIDIA because NVIDIA makes the chipset that we're using for black phone. And NVIDIA had apparently acquired a company uh, a while back that made um, a baseband processor. It was built, built around a software-defined radio. And... Um, and so I asked them that question. I said, can we do an a, a independent security review of the, of the uh, firmware for the baseband processor? And they said they would be open to that. In fact, they were delighted to have a, a customer express an interest in really taking a close look at their baseband processor. Uh, no other customer had ever brought up the question before. Um, you know, no other customer was, is as obsessive about it as we are. So actually what I'd like to do is I'd like to figure out a way to decouple the baseband processor so that it, isn't, it doesn't have read-write access to the application uh, uh, processor's memory. And I, I think that th there may be ways to do that. I've, I've heard that some baseband processors have that are decoupled that you can talk to them through like AT commands, like the old modem commands. Uh, if, if that's the case, then that would be a better way to go. So we'll, we'll, keep, um, we'll keep pursuing that with uh, NVIDIA, or if, or if we use any other baseband processors, we'll, we'll always be pursuing that. We're just starting with Black Phone. It's kind of a journey. We have, to, we have to work hard to take all the pieces and make them all secure one by one. Do you know what core processes in the phone that your baseband processor has access to? Like traditionally, it has access to GPS, camera, data storage, does that affect black phone? Um, I don't know what the baseband processor has access to. I, I think you'd have to talk to Mike Kershaw, the CTO of black phone. I'll raise that question with him. I'm going to be meeting with him pretty soon about things relating to the baseband processor. Thank you. Yeah. How do we make a solution such as Silent Circle so ubiquitously used by even the average man that the use of it doesn't make you the anomaly for further analysis and um, scrutiny? You know, uh, that's a good question. And I think that really is not so much just about Silent Circle, but about the whole question of crypto. And I th I'd like you to take a look at the legislative environment we find ourselves in today. Uh, in, during the 1990s, when we were fighting the crypto wars, you had to defend yourself. You had to justify why you were using strong crypto. If you were using strong crypto, then uh, why? Why did you need to use strong crypto? Are you a drug dealer? Are you a child pornographer? Are you a, a terrorist? Uh, justify why you need to use strong crypto. That was the, the mindset that we faced in the 1990s when we began fighting the crypto wars. If you fast forward to today, we now are in a legislative environment that has been turned on its head. We now have to justify ourselves if we are not using strong crypto. If, uh, you, know, if you are a, a doctor or a, a medical institution, uh, you are required to use strong crypto to protect your patient records. If you're a company 
and 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 you have and you and you leave your laptop computer in a taxi that has 200,000 customer names on the disk you better hope to god that that disk is encrypted because if it's not you're going to have to go public and announce that you lost 200,000 customer names that you know the, the the legislative environment has been turned around you know sarbanes oxley requires you to protect company assets uh, and um, that it doesn't explicitly mention crypto, but everybody knows that you need to use crypto to do that. There's all kinds of legislative things in the environment today that we didn't have in the 90s, and now today you have to justify why you're not using strong crypto. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the current version of the USA Freedom Act that's uh, favored by the Senate Intelligence Committee and also the White House mandates that phone companies now do the bulk metadata collection that the NSA used to do, it's for 18 months as opposed to five years. Understanding that your phone service does something a bit different, I wonder if you could comment on the current version of the Freedom Act that's favored and how do you think its passage might affect the services you look to offer? Well, you know, all of these, um, you know, CALEA and other laws that that impose uh, requirements on phone companies uh, are largely imposing requirements on phone companies. They don't impose requirements on end users. Now, the ZRTP protocol performs its calculations in the client software, which is owned by the end user. And so we're not in violation of CALEA as a service provider. If CALEA requires us to hand over whatever we have to the government, well, we don't have any keys and we can't hand them over if we don't have them. So I don't think that, you know, the legislative uh, initiatives that we might see are going to have that much effect unless they try to go back and say that people are not allowed to use strong crypto at the client. I just don't see that happening. We, we fought and we won in the 1990s in the crypto wars. I don't see that being rolled back. You know, after 9-11, I thought for sure that somebody would try to roll them back, but they did not. In fact, it was, it was kind of interesting because at 9-11, our attorney general was John Ashcroft. Now, during the 1990s in the crypto wars, John Ashcroft was a senator, and he, it, it was, was during the Clinton years. And uh, I met with John Ashcroft along with other activists, crypto activists. And he was convinced that we were right, that we needed to change the export controls, we needed to not pursue the clipper chip. Uh, and, and so he was on our side. Later, he became attorney general, and he did not change his position. So even though we lost a lot of other civil liberties under John Ashcroft, he didn't try to roll back the gains that we had won in the crypto wars of the 1990s. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you no. publish, sorry. Um, I was pointing to a guy in the front row. You really should stand in line back there, but uh, if you yell really loud, I can hear you. How, how do we do what we do without any public key infrastructure? I, I told you that we verbally compare a hash of the session key. How do you authenticate the communication partner? Well, okay, if you're asking about the signaling, we send our signaling through a TLS tunnel. We have a public key infrastructure there, but not from a certificate authority. We put uh, a public key certificate in the client. We bake it into the client. There is no, it doesn't depend on certification by a certificate authority. We actually do have a certificate authority sign it, but we don't care because we bake in the key into the client. And uh, you're supposed to know who you're talking to. If you don't know who you're talking to, then uh, you, you might have other problems because, uh, you know, it's not our job to guarantee that, that the person that you're <coughs> conspiring with is, is actually the person that you know or is it an imposter? Yeah. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you publish all your source code and that we can have a look at it and verify that the client is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. 
and you've you've got this great system where you display the hash on the phone on the on the screen so that we don't have to trust that the back end is doing what it's supposed to do. But how can I verify that the actual binary that's running on my phone was built from that source? Well, you can compile it yourself and see if it was uh, if if it's the same. It's not so easy though because you know modern development environments have so much complexity. You know they they might have timestamps in the binaries, for example, when you do the compile. It might be hard to do that. But what you can do is you can compile it yourself and run it and use the, what you run yourself. If you're on Android, that's easy to do. If you're on Apple uh, devices, not so easy because you have to be an Apple developer. Um, I don't know if you can really compare the binaries uh, because of, I don't know if, if you make a fresh binary, if it's really going to have the same, all the bits the same down to all the timestamps. But it's the best we can do. You know, I, one thing I'd like to say is, is that we all, I get a lot of people ask me about how hopeless the surveillance society is, the pervasive surveillance. And I, I feel like if we feel that it's hopeless, we, then we're less likely to do something about it. Hopelessness has a kind of paralyzing effect. And I'd like to point out that there have been a lot of, a lot of times in history where we faced very difficult problems that seemed hopeless, that we couldn't solve them, and yet we did. I mean, there was a time when slavery was an entrenched institution with with powerful moneyed interests behind it that were, see, were seemingly so entrenched that it would be no hope of ever changing it. And yet, we did get rid of slavery, not just in the US, but in pretty much the rest of the world. And there was also a time when we had uh, the, the nuclear arms race. That's, that seemed to be something that we could never change. We were facing a global nuclear holocaust. And yet, somehow, the arms race came to an end. Uh, the American Civil Rights Movement seemed to be a very difficult problem in the 1950s and the 1960s. And yet, we were able to make great progress there. Um, you know, going back further in history, there was the divine right of kings. A king could just chop your head off, you know? And yet, we managed to move past that Globally, we, we managed to come up with Western democracies with constitutions and parliaments. And even if they had kings, they, they were monarch, they were just, uh, they were constitutional monarchies where the king couldn't chop your head off anymore. Um, we managed to solve a lot of problems that seem to be insolvable. I think that the, what we face today with the pervasive surveillance may at this moment seem to be an insolvable problem. But I disagree. I think that like many other solvable problems before, seemingly insolvable problems before, we found a way to get past it. I think we can do that now. I think that if we deploy technology like Silent Circle, and we also push back in policy space and try to change the laws, and in fact these two things are, are related because sometimes you can change the laws by deploying technology and having it become the new norm this creates public expectations that make it unthinkable to have laws that can intrude upon what everybody has gotten used to. I mean, when you do online banking today, you're using SSL. And, you know, if the government tried to say, well, all the, all the connections through web browsers have to go through a government proxy, you can't talk to your bank anymore without the government seeing the conversation you're having with your bank, people would reject that. The new norm is that we have pervasive crypto. Um, and, and so we need to create pervasive phone calls that are encrypted and make that the new norm. And then this will cause the legislative environment to change. This will push back. Now, you know, what's happened with, with the reason why we won in the 1990s so we got everybody to participate in a big public policy debate, and we won. We got the export controls turned back, and we got the domestic controls. Um, you know, there was the clipper chip. 
that we killed those before they could get any traction. Um, I think we can do the same thing here. Yeah. Uh, I just wondered what uh, license the source code is released under? Uh, it's a, it's, it's some kind of a, I, I'm not sure, it, it might be either a GPL or it's some special license that allows you to do things with it, but I think that you're not allowed to make money with it. Uh, I'm not sure of the terms. You go to the Silent Circle website, you can read the fine print of the license. But you know, the ZRTP uh, protocol does have an open source license. It's under the LGPL, which is a pretty reasonable open source license. So people can use that to create other products. There are other ZRTP products out there. Yeah. So, uh, well, on the subject of making uh, secure communications for voice uh, more ubiquitous, one of the key things I think that's going to be important for that is making emergency services through, for example, 911 uh, available in a secure way. Given your thoughts on the, the challenges of PKI infrastructure with uh, a sort of a non-technical public, when we have to start securing things around the media channel, like location determination, location validation, and in next generation 911 when we're passing URIs to health records and things like this, what do you see as sort of the opportunities to make that work in a way that still allows us to have secure communications? Well, it's an interesting question because as, as you were describing that, I began to think of the uh, terrible frustration of trying to call 911 because my house is on fire and uh, I'm getting a public key certificate that's expired <laughs> with a little alert box that tells me that it's expired and, you know, what a nightmare that would be. Kind of reminds me of a scene in, in, in the old... Uh, in the old original Terminator movie, there was a scene where somebody calls 911 and they get a recording saying, all lines are busy right now. Uh, actually, you never get that when you call 911, but it was, it was a great device in the movie to, uh, to you know, <laughs> great, a great plot device in the movie. Um, we're going to have to, if, whatever it is that we do for emergency services, we have to do it in a way that if the crypto stuff isn't working the way it should, that it gets out of the way. Because right now, nobody cares about encrypting the calls to 911. And if we start encrypting the calls to 911, that's all nice that we can do that. But if we can't, if there's some reason why the PKI, the fucking PKI doesn't work, you know, I want to fucking talk to 911, regardless. So we have to be able to fall back to unencrypted or encrypted with keys that you don't care about because you just want an ambulance to get here right now. Um, so, you know, I've heard people say that, that like in silent phone, if you can't negotiate keys for some reason, like maybe if somebody's, if somebody's done something bad to our servers and, and the servers fall under the control of, of you know, the evil NSA, if they hack in and turn off, um, you know, TLS so that the signaling can't do TLS, I, I think we should find a way to make the call anyway. Because uh, if, we, if, we start, if we actually start using it for emergency services, we should definitely find a way to get around it and, and make a call no matter what. Any kind of VoIP that involves emergency services should be able to make an unencrypted call if necessary. It could display on the GUI that the call's not encrypted. Actually, that raises an interesting question. How do you make a GUI that, that can be all over the world in 30 different languages um, and, and, and make the users understand what the security state is? It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, with Z Phone and with the uh, first versions of, uh, of uh, Silent Phone, we just did them in English, uh, but now we're kind of struggling with trying to deal with uh, doing it in 30 languages or doing it graphically. Yeah, okay, it's five minutes to go. Oh, you had, you had a question. 
Good. Um, I take it you saw the news this week that Yahoo are bumping up in search results those companies that are offering HTTPS. I wanted to know what you thought of that. And also... Say that again. Um, maybe I'll stand on closer. Um, did you see the news this week that Yahoo are bumping up in the search results those websites that use HTTPS? Oh, yeah, yeah. And also, what do you think of Yahoo as the new internet moral guardian? You know, the, when, when they started the company Yahoo, they didn't, they didn't found it with the motto, don't be evil. And yet, uh, they seem to be very interested in not being evil, so that's, that's inspiring. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they're doing it. You know, what you're seeing here is all of this is kind of a, a tectonic shift because of what we saw with Snowden's revelations. Everybody in the security industry is trying to um, up their game. And, I, and I've, I think that's why phone companies are interested in, in working with us, because they're feeling market pressure from their user base. So, I think that the time is, is, has come now that we now have the wind at our backs with market pressure. And we have a lot of motivated security people that are finally able to get traction with their own employers to, to you know, to get everything hardened up. We're seeing products everywhere try to up their game and services. In Silent Circle, our whole reason to exist is all about uh, security. You know, the entire purpose of Black Phone is to make a privacy phone. It's, it's not an Android phone with some privacy features. It is a, is a privacy phone that we based on Android. Everything that we do with it is all gonna be about protecting your privacy. It's not just silent phone, it's, it's everything else on the platform. You know, uh, the, when you, uh, I've been working on, on crypto software for a long time and the question has always been, well, what about if somebody breaks into your platform? And I say, well, it's out of scope of my software. Uh, I can't control this, if I can't operate on, an, on a clean execution platform, then I can't make any security guarantees. Well, Steve Jobs said, and if you want to do a good operating system, you have to build your own hardware. Well, that's what we're doing now. We're building our own hardware. We're building a special, a purpose-built phone whose purpose is to give you privacy. So we, we're hoping that that becomes the new expectation, that that becomes the new normal. Okay, am I out of time now? No, I got, I got a couple of minutes to go. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, we get our chips from NVIDIA. Uh, the question is, where, do the, where are the parts built? The chips are made by NVIDIA. I don't know where they build their chips. Um, we assemble the parts in China. Yes, I know, I know, China, yeah. But we, we, get the, we get the phones back and we put our probes on and we look at all the bits that are in there and make sure that there are bits that we, that we put in. We also have our own people in the Chinese factory supervising it. But you know, maybe we'll build them somewhere else someday. Yeah. What? Is the phone hardware open source? Well, no, it's, it's NVIDIA's chipset. I mean, NVIDIA is a company that builds chips. They're nice chips. They use them in a lot of other phones. So they're not open source. But hey, you know, we have to work with the materials we have. Yeah. Uh, so what's the thing in privacy, security, cryptography that you are the most excited about that may have nothing to do with black phone? Um, hmm, good question. I think I've gotten a little bit too much tunnel vision. I've been focusing on our own stuff too much. Uh, <laughs> Um, you, you know, actually it isn't really just one product. I think what has me excited the most is that now I don't have to twist so many arms. Everybody now is, is uh, coming home to Jesus, you know? If I ever meet Snowden, I'll have to thank him for waking everybody up.
Okay, had, I think that's it. Oh, uh, one, one more, yeah. Uh, I just found out, what is your thoughts on the emergence of quantum encryption? Quantum encryption. Well, quantum encryption is an interesting uh, bit of science that is a lot of fun. I, I majored in physics before I switched to computer science. But it's not easy to apply it to uh, the general use cases. You know, you have to do it only over fiber optics. And, you know, I, I need to be able to do practical things over Wi-Fi and Ethernet and, and, and all kinds of other things. I need to be sitting on an airplane and, and make a secure call through the, through the airplane's Wi-Fi, which goes up to a satellite and back down to the ground. I mean, quantum cryptography is an interesting petri dish uh, science experiment. And it is a lot of fun, but I, I don't see it as really something that's going to change the world. But um, do you think that once it is perfected, it would work well with your ideas, if ever? Well, I, the, you can't really get beyond fiber optics or very special uh, line of sight right. operations with it. So I don't think it's going to get beyond that. It's a lot of fun, but I don't see it as being practical. I, I, I would rather use public key algorithms. Okay, I think we're done. Very nice. All right. Very nice.